One thing that I've realized from living in a van is that it's hard to have too much power. So in my new van, I'm putting in an electrical system that I think would be considered by most to be completely overkill. And so I'm gonna be going through this system, talking about how I've spec'd it out and why I think it's going to work well for me. And this is not meant to be a comprehensive how-to video, but it might provide context for you as to how you want to spec out your own system. On the roof of my van, I have four 100 watt rigid solar panels. That's a lot of solar, but if I had room, I would have even more. Flexible solar panels are an interesting option, but flexible panels are much more expensive than rigid panels, and they are seemingly much less durable as well. Flexible panels are easily damaged by heat, they can delaminate, and they can be scratched because they have a plastic surface instead of glass. So you're lucky to get five years out of a flexible panel, whereas most rigid panels will easily last for 20 years and the warranty reflects that. I trusted those flexible panels guys and they are just not high quality products. I've had so many problems with them and I don't think I'll make that mistake again. Solar power is nice because the energy you're collecting is passive and it's free. It can however be frustrating if you're heavily relying on solar and it is cloudy. It's also important to keep in mind that solar generation sharply declines in the winter months, especially if you are further north. So to combat this issue, in my new van, I am going to have four times the energy storage. Admittedly, part of this is because I'm planning to run an induction cooktop instead of propane, and a cooktop is going to consume a lot of power. But also I want to be able to stay in one spot off-grid even if the weather isn't favorable to solar charging. So my old van had a 200 amp hour lead acid battery, and the thing about lead acid batteries is that you can't really drain them below 50% of their capacity, and if you do, you will be significantly reducing the life of the battery. Lithium batteries hold up to more cycles, you can discharge them all but completely, they charge more efficiently, and they're lighter weight. So in my van, I am going to have four times the usable capacity with two 200 amp hour lithium batteries, and these two batteries weigh 30 pounds less than the behemoth lead acid battery that I had in my first van. The only real disadvantage of lithium is their low temperature performance. In particular, they don't like being charged when they're below freezing, and these cheaper batteries don't have a BMS that automatically cuts off when the temperature is low. So that is why I have this charge controller, which can be configured configured so that the charging output is turned off when the battery temperature is too low. And while I'm talking about the charge controller, it's worth mentioning that I'm running a 40 amp MPPT charge controller. Unless you're running a really basic solar system with one 12 volt panel, you give up a lot of charging efficiency when you run a cheaper PWM charge controller. So in most cases, it is worth investing in a MPPT controller over a PWM. And hooked up to these batteries, I have a 3000 watt Renogy inverter. Renogy is known for rebranding other equipment that is on the cheaper end and then providing it to the US market with a warranty. And knowing that Renogy sells equipment of questionable quality, I am way over specking this inverter. I never intend to pull 3000 watts out of this inverter. And if you take anything away from this video, I think this is the most important tip. If you're not purchasing high end or name brand components, you should not expect the lower tier stuff to hold up to its advertised capacity. This is unfortunate, but it's also true. It was a hot summer day, about 35 degrees in here, and I thought I'd air fry some ribs. I ended up melting the plug into this socket, so this one no longer works. Rather than buying pre-made cables, I made all of my cables, and I would absolutely recommend this unless you have a very simple system and a lot of space. Cable management would have just been a nightmare if I wasn't able to cut down the cables that I was using. I also used a hammer crimper to crimp all the connections, and while this worked, it felt very caveman-esque and paying a little more money for a dedicated crimping tool, especially when putting together a setup of this size, would have been money well spent. So this is a 500 amp current shunt and it plugs into my Renogy battery monitor, which I found to be pretty cool and useful. It gives you a percentage capacity of your battery and is super useful for budgeting your power. The battery monitor shows net power consumption or charging. It calculates a battery charge percentage and it shows you the time to fully discharge or charge at the current rate of charging or discharging. And then here on my switch panel, I have a cutoff switch for the solar panels. I have this here to prolong the life of my lithium batteries. Lithium batteries experience the most wear when they are charged above 80% or discharged below 20% of their capacity. So this will allow me to strategically switch off charging when I don't need to use the full capacity of my battery bank. 
Lithium batteries run a really wide gamut in price. You can even build your own lithium battery by buying the cells and the BMS individually and wiring it up and putting it into a case. Personally, I think that some of the off-brand batteries offer an excellent value. Power Queen is a funny name for a battery, but so far the performance has been excellent. And Will Pros has done a teardown on this battery and found really no issues with it other than it doesn't have a low temperature cutoff built into the BMS. Typically, these only pull 1,500 to 2,000 cycles. If you buy an SOK or an EG4, you're going to get 4,000 to 8,000 cycles. And then even though solar power is my primary source of charging in my van, I do have a battery to battery charger that hooks up to the alternator when the vehicle is running and a shore power charger that I can use when I'm parking in a friend's driveway or at a campground with electrical hookups. My battery to battery charger is only 20 amps and that's because I kept the vehicle's electrical system completely stock. I don't have a high output alternator or have upgraded any of the wiring under the hood. And I'm going to be careful to only use this charger during the the daytime when I'm not running the headlights and other heavy electrical loads. If you want to pull more than 20 amps from a vehicle's electrical system, you generally need to upgrade the electrical system. My shore power charger is hilariously cheap and also hilariously loud when it is in use, which is why I have it switched with a solid state relay. This also allows me to use power from the shore power plug without overloading the circuit. So my van has two inverters. This one is only 300 watts, and the reason I installed this is because according to Renegy's documentation, their 3000 watt inverter uses two and a half amps even when it's not doing anything. So when I'm using an inverter to do something low power like charge a laptop or run a computer monitor, it seemed wasteful to have the 3000 watt inverter running for that entire time. So that's why I installed this 300 watt inverter. But what I found after I got this whole system set up is that the Renogy 3000 watt inverter uses less than an amp when it's turned on. So this addition is somewhat useless. The 300 watt inverter does only use point 3 amps, but it's closer to 0.5 because I have it switched with an 80 amp automotive relay. And a quick note with that relay, I bought it on Amazon, it's not name brand, and the wires that came with it would in no way hold up to 80 amps, even for a short amount of time. So that's another example of why you would want to overspec an unbranded or cheaper electrical component. And yeah, I used a lot of heavy gauge wire to put this system together. I bought my wires on Amazon, and I'm not sure if that's the best source, but I found that buying a large quantity of heavy heavy gauge wire and crimp connectors, it wound up being cheaper than just minimally specking the wires. And then I chose to go with kind of a middle of the road circuit breaker. This brand T Tokus is sold on Amazon, Blue Sea Systems being the gold standard. I encountered personally a 200 amp no-name breaker that had terminal lugs that were too small to accommodate the appropriate wire gauge, and the breaker was popping with less than 60 amps of current going through it. So definitely do not cheap out on the circuit breakers. Also, in my last van, I did cutoff switches and fuses, and I found these breakers are nice because they function as both a switch and a fuse all in one. So there's definitely value to be had there. And finally, this funky little thing is a 12 volt power converter, 12 volt nominal LifePo batteries have a maximum charging voltage of about 14.6 volts. And unfortunately, if you try to run my vent fan, the Max Air fan, at 14.6 volts, it is very likely that the motor controller will burn out. And there are many documented cases of this happening. And the crazy thing is that Ericsson does not take responsibility for this issue. They instead blame the consumer for not running the correct voltage. Well, I got a new problem in my life. This time it's to do with the roof vent. When I try to turn it on, it glitches out, it starts beeping, the light starts flashing, and I have to pull out the fuse in order to reset it. I talk to customer support. They think it's a voltage issue on my end, but nothing has changed with my setup. <laughs> The reason I think this is so crazy is that everything else in my van has no issues running at 14.6 volt. And this is even more frustrating because Ericsson has a patent on the rain guard design of their Max Air fan. And I find the times when I need my vent fan the most are when it is actively raining or snowing. The good news is the patent for their rain guard design runs out in 2024. So if you're shopping for a vent fan in 2024, definitely keep an eye out for competitors making a similar design. So it can be really hard 
hard to know how much battery capacity and how much charging you really need in a van. A good place to start is on the Far Out Ride website. They have a pretty cool calculator that will calculate your energy consumption, and you can kind of guess from there. I started by using a calculator, I actually made a spreadsheet of my own, and I wound up not being super satisfied with the system that I put in my first van. So my advice to you is to over-spec everything. Bring more batteries than you think you'll need, bring more charging than you think you'll need, put as many solar panels on your roof as you can, and you will be happier in the long run. Obviously there is a cost to this, but the peace of mind that your fridge is going to keep running and you can actually enjoy traveling and not base your traveling around keeping your batteries topped off is huge. So it's a lot of work to put together a system like this, and a good alternative is to just buy a solar generator. Lots of them have inverters, charge controllers, and everything you need built into one compact unit. And even better yet, they are warrantied. The only thing that I don't like is that they tend to lack battery capacity and inverter output, and they are pretty expensive for what they are. So I think if you're willing to put the work in, it's ultimately a better value to put together a system of your own. And then if you have issues with one component, you can just swap that component and keep your system running. Running. You don't have to pull out the entire system and be without power while you're going through the warranty process or getting it fixed. There are also tons of great resources on how to set up solar systems. Uh, Will Pros is like the gold standard. He has a lot of great videos, but I've never seen him build something off-grid that's designed to go in a van quite like this. And uh, yeah, that's why I thought I would share this. So as a final note, if you are looking to build a electrical system yourself, you wanna make sure you're doing it in a safe way. And I am not here to advise you how to do that. And a lot of people seem to think, oh, as long as you add fuses and get the right wire gauge, your system is going to be safe. But there's a lot of nuance to designing a system like this to make it safe that goes beyond just wire gauge and fusing. So what I will say is be safe out there. If something doesn't feel right, hire a professional. Another thing that I thought of while editing this video is that I often get requests for links to products that I'm using, and I know Amazon has an affiliate program that allows you to link to their website, but I would actually encourage you to not use Amazon as much as possible. Often buying direct from the manufacturer is cheaper, and then you have a record with them having bought the product, and there's a lot of problems with the Amazon affiliate program. I've clicked on affiliate links that link to a completely different product than the one that was claimed to be linked to. And I've actually purchased stuff that wound up not being what was featured in a video. So I will leave a list of all of the products that I have used in putting together my electrical system, but I'm not going to link to any specific website. And that's to encourage people to shop around. 